Hi friends, welcome to Compass Online. You know, during his earthly ministries and talking with people about faith, sometimes Jesus played it cool and he went low and slow. But sometimes he wasted no time in getting right into it with people. Uh, listen to these quotes from Jesus. These are quotes that are all first words of his in the Gospels about him. Jesus said, the time has come, repent and believe, come and follow me. Or another place he said, why are you searching for me? Great question. Another place he said, what do you want? Come and you'll see. Jesus got right into it with people. And today, as we seek to make thoughtful connections with people about Jesus, we've got to sense what speed is he asking me to share with today? You know, we gotta pray as we talk. Our, our prayer and our share are a pair. You know, last week I had a long faith conversation with a guy that I had just met through my son's sports team. And we talked for over 30 minutes about God and church, but I didn't press him on anything specific about faith. You know, he grew up Muslim and he isn't practicing any faith these days, but I'm praying that we get an opportunity to talk more. But then the next day, I had a faith conversation with a different guy in my neighborhood that I had met before. And we were talking about a whole range of topics until I turned the conversation and I said, so what's been your faith journey so far? And we ended up spending 15 minutes talking about his views on life and death and faith. You know, he believes that we turn to dust and that's that. You know, and in the end I said to him, I think you're more special than you give yourself credit for. I believe God says you have intrinsic and eternal value. You know, we'll see how that hits with him in the long run. But how about you? How is your prayer and your share a pair this fall? Are you looking for ways that you could go slow or get right to the point in God conversations that Jesus is calling you to? You know, Jesus modeled this both for us, uh, discerning when to be casual and when to be challenging. And God is inviting you to be prayerful and relational and part of his redemption plan for specific people. Amen? All right, let's worship him together right now.
his church to deep compassion for the poor, and we want to answer him for the good of our cities. There are thousands of families in our community that are under-resourced, and we know God is inviting our church, all six of our campuses, to join him in his restorative work. And that's where Compass Local comes in, and ministries like Gift Mart. Gift Mart is a reimagined holiday shopping experience for families in our local schools that are facing economic hardship. Seven years ago, we actually hosted our very first Gift Mart in this school location, in the gymnasium. This is Scott Elementary School at Naperville. And because of the honoring way in which Gift Mart operates, we now have partnerships with multiple school districts and schools in our area. Districts 58, 200, Districts 203, and Districts 204, which means this year we'll actually be hosting three different Gift Mart shopping experiences at our Naperville campus, South Naperville campus, and our Wheaton campus. So here's how Gift Mart works. Social workers personally select and invite the families to come to our church. And then our church family, along with the local schools, provide brand new toys, gift wrap, and volunteers for three Gift Mart locations. When we host Gift Mart, we are demonstrating that God deeply cares about all families. Well, probably the question I get asked the most is why do we need this program here in such an affluent community? But when we take a look at the numbers in the four districts, 20% of our students qualify for low income. And that's a staggering 16,000 students over four districts, 700 which are homeless. But parents are choosing to move to our community to give their children better lives. One of the awesome things is that on average, we have a 95% graduation rate. We're in our neighboring Joliet at 77%. But then they're also faced with 146% higher cost of living to be here. So as they're stretching for housing and they're stretching for food and they're stretching for transportation, it leaves room for little else. In these affluent communities, our Gift Mart families can often feel isolated and discouraged. But the gift of Gift Mart is hope. We provide assistance during the holidays that provides dignity for our families. Gift Mart is a wonderful opportunity for some in our community 
to experience the full beauty of Christmas that they might not otherwise be able to experience. He gives them an opportunity to go and shop and spend their money on buying gifts that they've picked out for their children. The gifts are wrapped, so all the beauty involved in opening those gifts in Christmas morning are captured as well. And it's a wonderful opportunity for them to also maintain their dignity as they reach out, as we all do, sometimes need a helping hand. And this is a beautiful program for not only those that receive, but those that give as well. The gift of Gift Mart is hope. And we invite all of you at all of our campuses to join the mission of Compass Local this holiday season by demonstrating the love of Jesus to these families. Welcome back to the Compass Church and welcome back to week two of our series. Remember what it's called? It's called Pursuing God Through Prayer. That's right. And here we are today in Stillman Valley, Illinois, this little town about an hour west of the Chicago suburbs. And specifically, we're at a battlefield in Stillman Valley. No kidding. This is the site of the first conflict of the Black Hawk War. It's also a spot where Abraham Lincoln, the great president, had a pivotal event in his life. I need to tell you what happened. This was back in the summer of 1832 when Lincoln was a young man, only 23 years old, working in the general store in the central Illinois town of New Salem. Lincoln was bored to tears, sleepy job, not doing very much business when some of his buddies ran into the shop and they invited Lincoln on an adventure. Turns out they said that the governor of Illinois had just made a call for volunteers to join the militia. Illinois needed an army quick because Black Hawk, the chief had led the Native American warriors into Illinois, crossing east over the Mississippi River, and they had come to take back the land that had been stolen from them. Lincoln's like, ah, oh, do I wanna join the army? He said, sign me up, boys. And he borrowed a horse and they started riding for two weeks north to this area where he was sworn in as a soldier. Now, Lincoln only served in the militia for three months. He never saw any combat himself, but he saw the aftermath of combat right here. Here's what happened. It was only six days into Lincoln's tour of duty when they got word that there had been a fight. Turns out that some of the militia had been camped on this hill when Black Hawk and his warriors arrived the militia freaked out. You know, these guys had no training. They had never been in battle. And when they saw the fierce warriors, they ran. <laughs> they all took off. I, I say they all took off. Technically, 12 of them made their stand on this hill. And those 12 were killed. And Lincoln and his buddies were assigned the task of marching to this spot and burying the dead. Can you imagine the young Abraham Lincoln walking up to the top of this hill where he was horrified to see these mangled bodies, blood everywhere. They had been scalped, they had been killed. Lincoln just was sick to his stomach. He wanted to run, but he had been given a job. And so they dug the graves, they dragged the bodies, they wrapped their bodies in blankets, they buried them over with the dirt and did their best to honor the dead. And this experience was formative to Abraham Lincoln. He 
was going to experience war at its worst. In fact, he was president during the Civil War, which was the bloodiest war in American history. More Americans died in the Civil War than the First and Second World Wars combined. And so this was the place that Abraham Lincoln and the militia were first exposed to the horrors of war. Friends, speaking of first exposures to war, we're going to read the text where the Israelites were first exposed to war. You recall, they had been slaves in Egypt. They were brick makers until Moses, with God's help, led them out of their slavery, and they were headed toward Mount Sinai when they were attacked by the Amalekites. There's actually an interesting description of it in Deuteronomy 25, where Moses, looking back on the event, he says, people, do you remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out and they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind? Oh, what a terrifying experience. Again, the Israelites, they didn't know how to fight. And these Amalekites, they were raiders. They were like pirates, nomadic people that attacked to steal the possessions of everyone they could. And so this first battle of the Israelites was a nightmare. Friends, War turns out to be a place of prayer. We're going to see prayer be central in this battle of the Israelites and the Amalekites. Turns out that it's no new thing to link war and prayer. It has been said that there are no atheists in foxholes. When you're facing the trials of battle, turning to God in prayer is what people did. In fact, Abraham Lincoln, he said that the horrors of the Civil War drove him to his knees in prayer. So let's learn. Let's learn about prayer from the battle of the Israelites and the Amalekites. So the main account of this battle between the Israelites and the Amalekites is in Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 8. It says the Amalekites came and they attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Friends, we, from the Deuteronomy 25 passage we read, you can feel the drama. It was a ruthless attack. You know, the stragglers in the back would have been potentially the children or the elderly. And this attack was bloody, unanticipated, terrifying. You've got battle-tested pirates, these Amalekites, versus those who had never fought before in their lives. And it did not start well. But the next verse says this, verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Interestingly, when he says, this is our plan for tomorrow, apparently day one was this surprise attack where the stragglers were defeated. But as often happens in the case of war, they fight when the sun is up and as the sun sets, the sides regroup and then go at it again the next day. And apparently day one was a slaughter against the Israelites. But day two, a, a plan is formed. The plan involves Joshua as commander of the Israelite army and Moses up on this hill. Apparently, Moses is too old to fight. He's like, dude, you know, I, I don't have it anymore. Joshua, you're going to have to lead the fight. But what I can do is pray. You say, really? Is that what he was doing? Yeah, when he says, I'm going to go up on the hill, I'm going to stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. The staff of God. Moses' staff was a symbol of God's power, depending on the Lord. It's called the staff of God. Isn't that interesting? Originally, it was just Moses' walking stick. 
You know, as an old man, he needed a, a walking stick to lean on. But the staff had become the staff of God. Already in Moses' life, God had brought eight miracles through his staff. Let me tell you what they were. The first was that the staff itself turned into a snake when Moses appeared before Pharaoh. Uh, he said, hey, God's power is with me. Watch this. And he threw the staff on the ground and it turned into a snake. That got Pharaoh's attention. Uh, five of the ten plagues of Egypt involved the staff. The five were the Nile turning to blood, frogs, gnats, hail, and locusts. In each case, the staff was either used to hit the water, hit the ground, or he held it out and God brought about the miracle. In addition to that, when the Israelites were escaping from Egypt, Moses held it out over the Red Sea and the sea split with the power of God manifest through the staff. And then as they were on their way to Mount Sinai, uh, they were out of water and God said, Moses, hit the rock with the staff. And when he did, water burst out of the rock. And so the staff has become a symbol of reliance on God to do the supernatural. And so when Moses says, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hold, I'm going on the hill and I'm going to hold up the staff looking to the Lord. It's a sign, a visible sign of prayer, of crying out to God for him to bring a victory to the Israelites. I can pray. You fight, Joshua, I'll pray. How's that for a teamwork? Now, you should know that this kind of prayer that Moses did up on the hill is asking God for something. I want to clarify. Last week I said, prayer is so much more than your gift list, your request list, asking God to do this, that, or the other. And that's true. Prayer at its best is conversation with God about him, about life, about whatever we want to talk to the Lord about. But to Say that it's not requests is to go way too far because requests are part of prayer. In fact, I'll just introduce you to a couple words, one being supplication. A supplication is a prayer of request. Another is intercession. Intercession is a prayer of request. It's a type of supplication, but when you intercede, you're praying for someone. So Moses is going to be praying for Joshua and the army. So this is a Prayer of intercession, which is a type of supplication. And so that's really what we're looking at here. Let's see how it went, shall we? Verse 10 says, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, his brother Aaron, and his friend Hur, they went to the top of the hill. Remember? That was the plan. Verse 11. As long as Moses held up his hands... The Israelites were winning. But whenever Moses lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Friends, that simple verse has such a powerful theology of prayers, prayers of supplication, uh, just ingrained in it. So let, let's try to understand, shall we? Moses, like, you know, it's important to pray. So he's up on top of the mountain and he's like, Lord Almighty, we need you. And as he prays, he looks down and he's like, fantastic, this is unbelievable. The Israelites who don't know anything about war are fighting with a zeal, with a passion and an effect. I think our guys are winning. And then his arms got a little tired and he pulled them down and he's like, oh, this isn't good. It just turned. The tide turned and now we're losing. Oh, Lord, please help us. Thank you for helping us. Look at that, guys. I, I think we're winning again. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, and, oh, God, please. Oh, ooh, that ain't good. And then he's like, oh, God. And all of a sudden it clicks. You know, Moses wasn't the brightest bulb in the shelf, but he eventually realized maybe he tested his theory. He's like, oh, we're winning. We're losing. We're winning. We're losing. We're winning. Losing. And sure enough, what God was seeking to convey to Moses and all of his people was figured out. 
You look to me, God says, and I will intervene. I will answer your prayer and bring the victory. You stop praying. You stop depending on me. You start, you know, just going at it in your own strength. And God's like, I will withhold my blessing and failure will come your way. The importance of prayer. Now, let's, let's talk about this. It's it's very deep. You know, at first it seems simple, but in fact, it's quite deep. Um, it, it helps us understand why prayer and asking God to intervene is so important. Some people think that God lacks information. You know, Lord, I want to make you aware of a problem. I know you're busy, and so this probably isn't on your radar. So let me pray and give you information you didn't have. We don't pray to give God information. What was Moses praying, saying, Lord, there's a battle going on here that probably escaped your attention, so I'm going to... No, God knew. In fact, it says in Matthew 6, 8, God knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And so prayers of supplication, of petition, of asking God for things... It's not about making God aware. He knows everything. Some people think this. Is is it about motivating God to act? You know, please, Lord, I know you don't care, but I'm just begging you, do me a favor for my sake, would you please? And no, God doesn't need to be motivated. He loves us and wants to act on our part. He loved Israel and wanted to act, to bring victory in this battle against the Amalekites. In fact, later on, God, after the Israelites win the battle in Exodus 17, 14, God says, I will utterly wipe out the Amalekites from the face of the earth. They were very evil people. Their evilness evidenced by their attack of the elderly and the children that were at the end of the caravan. I mean, they were just nasty people who didn't care about others or about God. And the Lord desired to wipe them out. Well, then why didn't he just bring victory the whole time? Why did he require prayer? It's the right question. It's not for lack of information. It's not for lack of motivation. God wants to act. But he often waits until we ask. In fact, I'm just going to say that again. God often waits until we ask. He wants us to rely on him. Because he wants us to rely on him, he often waits to act until we ask. I say often, not always. God can act without us ever praying, and often he does. Uh, When we ask, does that mean God automatically will act? No, but often God is waiting to act until we ask. This is how he gets us in a posture of dependence on him. We were made to cling to him, to rely on him. And so God says, I want to bring victory to Israel, but I'm not going to do it, Moses, until you ask and look to me. It reminds me, we just said, Uh, Halloween and trick-or-treating this week, I've noticed a trend among the young people who trick-or-treat. They no longer say, trick-or-treat. They just arrive at their door, and they, uh, so I would uh, just uh, taunt them. I'd open the door and say, oh, hello, children. What brings you here? And and they're looking at me like, you don't know? And I'm looking at them, you know, playing dumb. And then finally they say, Trick or treat? And I'm like, all right, that's what you wanted. I was waiting to be asked. And in the case of God, it's not trivial, though. The Lord's like, listen, you people tend to run off and think you can do life on your own power. You can't. And God says, I could make my power behind you at all times, but you'd think it's you. And so I'm going to make it clear through prayer that the victory is won by the power of the Lord. Think about it. Had the Lord just brought the victory to Joshua and the Israelite army, they would have said, can you believe we are all that? But now Moses is like, guys, let me tell you, I know why the victory came. (laughs) I prayed, 
you won. I stopped praying, you lost. Clearly the Lord gets the credit and the people became dependent on him. Prayer is a brilliant strategy God utilizes to form his people into those who recognize it's his power at play that brings the victory and a people who are perpetually dependent upon him. You know, when I, when I talk about perpetual dependence, we see that in, in the next verse. Let me read it. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone. When they, it's Aaron and Hur. Remember his brother and his buddy are up there with him? Uh, when his hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. So he got a chair to sit on. And then Aaron and Hur held up his hands one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Do you see the, the brilliant lesson that was learned? You know, Moses is like, oh, I'm, I'm learning that rely on the Lord and win. Fail to rely on the Lord and lose. And so now that Moses knows that, he's trying to remain in prayer. But physically, his arms are so exhausted that he's like, I can't do it anymore. And so his buddies, one on one side, one on the other, they help him hold up the staff and remain in a posture of perpetual dependence. And with that posture, they overcome. A couple things here. First of all, I love how the prayer is not just Moses. Now Aaron and her are joining in on this prayer reliance. It speaks of corporate prayer. Do you know what corporate prayer is? That's when not only are you praying, but others are joining you in prayer. There's communal or community prayer. And uh, I think of my grandmother when I think of this. Uh, my grandmother was like, you know, if I'm Moses praying, Lord, please bless our, our church. My grandmother was like, can I be her at your side, lifting, helping, participating in that cry for God to bless the Compass Church? My grandma, who died seven years ago, prayed for the Compass Church, prayed for me and my ministry every day. And when she passed away at 99 to go be with the Lord, I lost a prayer partner. I know so many of you pray. I'm told all the time of people who pray for our church daily and for me in particular. And thank you. This corporate prayer thing, a number of us, many of us coming together with a request. It's what God wants. It's one of the reasons why we have prayer requests on our website. Do you know about that? For years now, we've got a spot. You go on our website, you go to Next Steps, you'll see prayer requests. And this is a place where you can submit a prayer request. You can say, I'm praying for this, but I'd love for others to join in on that. And we've got a prayer team made up of some staff, some laity, and we pray for those prayer requests regularly. Use that tool. During this series, we're going to expand it a bit. You can Put in your requests for the prayer team to pray. Or you can say, no, let everybody who wants to pray at my whole campus, let them know of my request. You, you specify who you want praying. But this allows everybody at your campus to go online, click, see those prayer requests that are wanted to be known by the whole campus. And we can hold each other up in prayer in this way. I'm excited to think of all of the requests and all of the prayers that will happen through technology during this series and beyond. I, I wanted to highlight something in the verse that we just read, and that is, his hands remained steady. That's that posture of perpetual dependence. God wanted Moses, Joshua, and the people to all live constantly knowing how much they need the Lord. I like thinking of, of Moses and his staff. What is a staff? 
A staff is something you lean on. It's an old man saying, man, I walk in, my legs are not as stable. I, I'm a man in need of assistance. I, my grandmother, who I mentioned, died at 99 seven years ago. She had a walker. It's kind of like a staff or a cane. And we would sometimes tell her, Grandma, you need to get rid of that walker. You know, you're doing better. You're going to be strong. You don't need it. And she would look at us and say, I love my walker. I will lean on it for the rest of my life. And though we were like, hey, okay, don't mess with grandma and her walker. I think that commitment she has of, listen, for the rest of my life, I'm going to lean. I'll be weak and dependent upon my help. And that's how we should be with God to say, you know what? I love leaning on the Lord. I will lean on, I'm weak. I will depend on him both this day, tomorrow, and for the rest of my life. He is my strength and my support. This helps us understand how much should we pray. You know, some people will say, is it enough to ask God for a request three times? Is that like a, like a vending machine? You put in three coins and then you'll get what you want? That's not a vending machine. How much does he want us to bring our request to him? As many times as it takes for you to be in a posture of perpetual dependence. If you pray one time a year, is that going to put your heart in a posture of perpetual recognition that you need God? No. Daily? Twice a day? I don't know. You know. However many times it takes for you to live with this awareness that the success in my life is a victory brought by God. And without him, I'm doomed. That humble reliance is the posture of the soul accomplished through regular prayer. Well, I want to tell you a story uh, of when I learned this in powerful uh, expression. It has to do with my early days of ministry. I was a youth pastor. My first two jobs as a pastor were to high school students. And it was a train wreck. Friends, uh, the, the first job I had, I, I did it for two years, and not a single kid came to faith in Christ. It was a small group, but still, I was hoping for somebody to pray to trust Christ. Zilch. The second job I had was a church plant. And so I started with nothing. I had no salary. I was volunteer. I had no students. It was just a little church that didn't have any families with high school aged children. I didn't have a building. My parents actually opened up their basement. It was an unfinished basement. And they said, Jeff, your youth group can meet there. And so I, I recruited adult leaders, uh, four of them to be exact. And we started meeting in my parents' basement to have youth group on Thursday nights. And at first it was like, well, this is a little embarrassing. We've got me and my four adult leaders with no high school students. And so what I told them is, you know, maybe next week we'll have high school students. This week we'll just focus on leadership development. Week two, no students. Let's focus again on leadership development. Week three, no students. One more time. And do you know that we went almost six months meeting every Thursday night, adult leaders with no students? What kind of a youth group is that? People would say, you're a youth pastor, Jeff. I, yes, I am. And they'd ask me, how's it going? Not so good. I have no youth in my youth group. And I'll never forget, I came at the end of that six months to a place of despair. And I cried out. I'm like, Lord, what am I doing? I'm the worst pastor in the history of pastors. I'm like, God, I, my last youth group was a failure. This youth group is even worse. And I'm like, Lord, did I make a mistake in shifting from wanting to be a doctor to being a pastor? Maybe I misunderstood your will. Maybe I'm in the wrong calling. It was a dark, dark season in my life. One particular prayer, I was weeping, saying, Lord, I am the worst failure ever. What's going wrong, Lord? And in that prayer, God spoke to me. And he said, Jeff, you're not praying. You're relying on yourself. 
You think you're pretty sharp and that you can bring about fruit in your youth group without desperate reliance on me. In this flash of awareness, God just showed me my heart and my lack of humble reliance, my cocky independence, my prayerlessness. And God says, I ain't helping you until you cry out. I repented of this ugly self-confidence. I pledged perpetual prayer and reliance. And God said, Jeff, this season of failed ministry will forever be a testament as to what the great Jeff Griffin is able to accomplish on his own. Nothing. And from that night, I just said, God, I need you. I, I raised my hands in humble reliance. And wouldn't you know, the next Sunday at this little startup church, a new family arrived and they had a high school daughter, Stacy, a freshman. And we spotted her, and, you know, I was sitting with my volunteer leaders in the back of this little church service. I'm like, does she look like she's in high school? As soon as the service ended, uh, me and my leaders, we were like vultures, you know, right to this girl. And we invited her to the youth group. She's like, this little church has a youth group? And we're like, oh, yeah, we do. We've been having a youth group for half a year now. And uh, she said, well, tell me where it is and when and I'll come. And I said, you know, better yet, we will pick you up at your house. I didn't want, you know, her backing out. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, no, we're here to serve. So on that Thursday night, we showed up at her house. Uh, I had my truck, you know, SUV with the leaders and, and Stacy got in. And as we started driving to my parents' home, I, I, I broke the news to her. I, I was going fast enough, you know, and the doors were locked so she couldn't get out. And I said, Stacy, uh, you should know you're the only student who has ever come to this youth group. And she's like, that's weird. I'm like, yeah, it is weird. You're right. And she's like, oh, all right. You know, there's no turning back now. Well, we got together and we played some games. We sang some songs. We studied the Bible. And then as we were driving Stacy back home, I asked her, hey, Stacy, would you be willing to come again? And she's like, sure. She said, do you mind if I bring a few friends? And I'm like, no, that'd be, that'd be okay with us. Friends, do you know from that night on, God started doing a work where in 12 months' time, 75 high school students pledged faith in Jesus Christ as new believers. It was a revival. And the only thing that changed was that, that I was desperately reliant on God. Uh, the Lord wants to do work, but he's waiting until last. May we learn this lesson in every aspect of life. Every struggle is spiritual. Every struggle we face has a spiritual component. Are you bringing it to the Lord in prayer? It's a lesson I'll never forget. Let me show you one more verse in our passage. After Joshua won the war, in, 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 or the battle, in verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Write this down on a scroll as something to be remembered. You can't forget the lesson learned in this battle with the Amalekites. And I did something. I put a T-shirt from that youth group in this display box. Uh, this is the name of the youth group, 15th Street. And I keep this as a reminder of the lesson, painful and beautiful lesson I learned about the centrality of prayer and reliance on God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we need you. Oh, we need you. We can't do it at work, at home, parenting, finance, career, extended family relationships, health. In every arena of our lives, we need you. Teach us to pray until we are in a posture of humble reliance on you perpetually. Oh God, mold our hearts to where you want them, desperately reliant on you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, who 
Christ's love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm holding on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing Standing on your face 
Friends, we're calling on a God who was answering prayers back then. He's answering prayers now still today. In fact, we would love to pray alongside you with whatever you're praying about. You can use the QR code on the screen to be in touch with us and let us know, is there something that you're excited about, concerned about that we could come alongside you in prayer on? It would be our joy to do that. Uh, you could also let us know if you want to talk to one of us. Uh, we'd be happy to have a pastor have like a digital coffee video call with you or to get on a phone call with you and just have a prayer time as well. Let's be in touch. Let's be a church family together. And then thank you. So many people are giving financially to the ministries of our church. If you're one of those households, we love it. If you'd like to be one of those households, look at the screen for a prompt to our website where you can find out more how you could join in on this mission of helping people find and follow God. And then we're partway through this teaching series on prayer. We're talking about how prayer intersected with Moses in ancient times and how God is still intersecting with us today through the power of prayer. What a joy to have a relational God that we can learn about Let's get into more about how God practically connects with us in prayer today. We're gonna to do it next week. We'll see you back here at Compass Online.